Hello, and welcome to the February 2023 Lunchbox Lecture at the National D-Day Memorial. Um, today, we're going to be talking about Jesse Owens and his achievements at the 1936 Olympic Games in Berlin. Before we get into that, though, I want to do a little housekeeping um, and remind folks of some of our upcoming events. Our homeschool day will be held on Friday, March 31st of next month. Um, great opportunity for homeschool families to come take a tour, see the site, um, participate in fun activities, see some neat artifacts. Registration is available online now. Go to store.dday.org to get your tickets. Um, also keep on your radar our upcoming Family Day, which will be held on Saturday, uh, April 22nd, Saturday, April 22nd. It'll be a fun festival, music, food, uh, living historians. So again, keep that on your radar. Um, also, since it is almost the springtime, our winter hours are officially over next month. We'll be open seven days a week starting in March. So come by anytime to enjoy um, the flowers and the great weather. The daffodils are already blooming. The cherry trees are starting to bud. Um, so now is definitely a great time of year to come by. Um, so with that, I'm going to jump into the presentation. Nazi Owens, I'm sorry, Jesse Owens, Nazi ideology and the 1936 Olympics. And here we go. Excellent. Um, as you can probably imagine, we spend most of our time here at the National D Day Memorial talking about the events of June 6, 1944, the Allied landings on the beaches of Nazi occupied Germany. Um, but to understand how we got to that point, we really have to understand the conditions and events that contributed to the outbreak of war in the first place. Uh, one of those events was the 1936 Olympiad, the 11th Olympiad held in Berlin. Um, this was, we'll talk about this, sort of a, a really big opportunity for the Nazi regime to demonstrate to the world that it wasn't a threatening militaristic fascist state, but instead belonged um, you know, in the international community. And its success in this propaganda effort perhaps paved the way in some ways for the appeasement and um, you know, the sort of playing down of the Nazi threat that um, you know, eventually did lead to the outbreak of World War II. Um, now, of course, the star of those games, though, was Jesse Owens, an American athlete um, originally from Alabama who had moved to Ohio as, uh, as a young child, um, who won four Olympic gold medals there. Um, we're going to spend the bulk of today talking about Jesse Owens and his accomplishments. But I also want to talk a little bit about the fact that the 1936, like all Olympic games, uh, were full of remarkable stories and incredible um, athletic achievements. And even beyond the legacy of Jesse Owens, there are other legacies of the 1936 Olympics that endure today. So perhaps you've um, seen the movie or read the book Unbroken. Um, both are about an American runner named Louis Zamperini. He ran the 5,000 meters at the Olympics. His speedy last lap um, caught the attention of Hitler himself. He's perhaps better known, though, for his um, experiences during the war. He enlisted in the Army Air Corps and served as a bombardier during World War II. Uh, his plane crashed in 1943. He and some of his fellow pilots, um, rather, his fellow crew members, were adrift for 47 days um, before they were captured by Japanese soldiers and held um, in a prisoner of war camp for the rest of the war. Um, so, of course, just, you know, one, one enduring story from the 1936 games. Another enduring story is that of the boys in the boat. Um, this is a book, soon to be a movie directed by George Clooney, that tells the story of nine working class Americans um, from the University of Washington who overcame elite Ivy League rowers and German rowers uh, to capture gold at the 1936 Olympics. Um, beyond athletic achievements, uh, there are other legacies of the games that persist today. Uh, Leni Reifenstahl made a documentary about the 1936 games called Olympia, um, and it became one of the most important influential sports documentaries of all time. Although it was a really valuable piece of Nazi propaganda, and although Riefenstahl did have a close personal relationship with Hitler, um, 
this movie's influence on you know even sports documentaries that are produced today really can't be overstated it really was one of the most important movies um you know of that genre to date um another tradition that has endured since the 1936 games is that of the olympic torch relay the 1936 games were the first where uh, this relay happened um you know one thing about the olympics it's it's probably that before the games they carry the torch from athens to or from greece rather to wherever the games are being held um and this is something that again happened for the first time in berlin um, along its 3,422 kilometer route, Nazi propagandists held rallies to attract Germans to the Nazi movement. Um, so again, this is, you know, just like Olympia, the movie was an important piece of Nazi propaganda, but nonetheless has had a lasting influence on the Olympics and how they're carried out today. Um, but, you know, beyond the boys in the boat, beyond um, Louis Zambrini, beyond the influences of Olympia and the um, the torch relay. No story of the 1936 Olympics is more enduring, more compelling than that of Jesse Owens. Jesse Owens was born James Cleveland Owens in Oakville, Alabama in 1913. The youngest of 10 children, he was the son of a sharecropper and the grandson of enslaved people. Now, if you knew him as a child, you would probably have been pretty surprised to find out that later in life he became uh, one of the most accomplished athletes of his generation. He was pretty unhealthy, pretty sickly. Um, he, you know, in part because of malnutrition um, and in part just because of, of bad luck and inadequate health care. Um, he had these bouts of pneumonia. He had this chronic bronchial congestion. More than once, his mother had to remove growths on his chest and legs with a knife because they couldn't afford to go to the hospital to have them removed. He also had a share of childhood accidents. He once stepped in a steel hunting trap that his father had set up totally by accident. He was once run over by a piece of heavy farm machinery. Um, fortunately, he escaped without serious injury. Um, but nonetheless, he, you know, despite these childhood scrapes, he did become one of the, you know, most accomplished athletes of his generation. Um, and that is something, a talent that he really started to develop uh, when the Owenses moved to Cleveland, Ohio, after World War I. They were part of the first wave of what's called the first Great Migration, a large scale movement of black people, mostly from the rural South uh, to Northern cities. Um, these migrants were propelled by a number of factors, including racist violence and oppression in the South, uh, crop failures, which were caused by bull weevils and floods, and the replacement of farm laborers with machinery. So Owens and his family relocated to Cleveland, Ohio, just a coincidence that his middle name was Cleveland and that he ended up living in Cleveland. Um, where he met the man who would shape his athletic career, um, Charles Riley. At Fairmont Junior High School in Cleveland, um, the PE teacher there, this man named Charles Riley, uh, noticed pretty early on in their relationship that Owens was a really talented, a really special runner. So he started training Owens um, when Owens was just 13 years old. Two years later, by the time he was 15, Owens was running the 100-yard dash in 11 seconds flat. I'm going to pause here to talk about units for a second. Um, so he was running the 100-yard dash in 11 seconds. Um, if you're comparing that to Usain Bolt's time, maybe, um, and saying, wow, that's really, really fast, you might be thinking of the 100-meter dash. So 100 yards is, is not quite as long as 100 meters. Um, so really impressive, but a different, a different race than what is run you know, typically today at the Olympics and whatnot. Um, so for that 100 yard dash at the time, the world record was about 9.6 seconds. So Owens at 11 seconds at 15 years old was well, already within shouting distance of the world record. I mean, already, you know, certainly one of the fastest runners uh, in the state of Ohio. And he continued to improve. When he moved from Fairmont Junior High School to East Technical High School, he kept working with, with Riley, his mentor um, from his junior high school. And he kept getting better. When he was 18 in 1932, he qualified for the semifinal um, of the Olympic track and field tryouts, which were held at Northwestern University. Um, now, he didn't qualify for the Olympics that year. And in fact, he didn't even qualify for the Olympic trial finals. Um, but he did learn a lot from the top runners that he met and raced against um, at Northwestern that year. Um, and by the way, he did all this running. He did all this 
uh, record setting, um, you know, for his age while he was working multiple jobs and going to school. Um, he would train in the morning with Charles Riley, go to school all day, and then go to, you know, a number of jobs that he held uh, to support his large family. Um, so just incredible dedication um, and commitment to his craft, even from, you know, a pretty young age. By the time he was ready to run collegiately, he was a really highly touted prospect. Um, he chose to run collegiately at Ohio State University, I, rather the Ohio State University, I'm sorry, um, where he was coached by Larry Snyder. He picked Ohio State for a few reasons. Um, he, you know, looked at Indiana University as well, um, but he went to visit Indiana uh, with a friend um, when he was in high school, you know, on a recruitment trip. Um, right after there had been a lynching in that state and you know the attitudes and sort of the atmosphere you know that he encountered surrounding that lynching um you know sort of made him reconsider his choice in indiana so that's you know one reason that he ended up at ohio state um, and at ohio state he continued to excel he was known as the buckeye bullet there the um mascot of ohio state is the buckeye bullets are really fast he was the buckeye bullet um he won a record number of NCAA titles during his collegiate career. He was the first black man to captain in the Ohio State varsity team, really a storied um, athletic career. But it wasn't all good for Jesse while he was a student there. He was subjected, he and his black teammates were subjected to a lot of racism and discrimination, um, you know, even in the Northern state of, of Ohio. Black students, when Jesse was a student at Ohio State, were not allowed to live on campus um, with their white peers. Often black athletes were denied service um, at restaurants and hotels that the team stopped at when they were traveling between meets. Um, so, you know, to highlight Jesse's accomplishments, um, you know, we have to understand that he was doing all this in the face of, of incredible discrimination and racism. He also did it on his own dime. Athletic scholarships didn't really exist at this time. Um, so he continued to work and pay his way through school. Uh, while he was running, while he was setting records. The highlight of his collegiate athletic career came on May 25th, 1935 at a meet in Ann Arbor. Um, despite a back injury that had been caused by a fall, by a fall um, in about 45 minutes at this meet in 1935, he set three world records and tied another one um, in the 100 yard dash. He tied the world record in the 100 yard dash he set the world record in the broad jump, which is the event today known as the long jump. Um, he set the world record in the 220 yard dash and he set the world record in the 220 yard hurdles. Again, all of that in about 45 minutes and with a bad back that he'd had to soak and uh, you know get massaged. He even thought that he might not be able to compete. Um, by the way, his times in the 220 yard dash and the 220 yard hurdles were faster than the world records in the 200 meter dash and the 200 meter hurdles. Um, which are distances that are um, slightly less than the 220 yard versions. So he basically set two more world records if you're looking at um, you know, an event by event record comparison. Um, the folks in that picture there, um, that is Jesse on the left, Jesse Owens on the left wearing the Ohio jersey. He's shaking hands with Ralph Metcalf, um, another collegiate athlete from Marquette University who became um, one of Jesse's teammates on the 1936 Olympics and afterwards went on to a, a storied career as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, um, where he helped found the Congressional Black Caucus um, and contributed a lot to you know, American politics in that body. We'll talk a little bit more about him and some of the other athletes that Jesse competed with at the Olympics in a bit. Um, so by the time it was time, by the time um, Olympic qualification for the 1936 games rolled around, uh, four years after Jesse had failed to advance to the qualifying finals in 1932, Owens was the really, really heavy favorite um, in in three events, um, the 100 meter dash, the um, 200 meter dash, and then also the, the 200 meter hurdles. Um, and he really easy, you know, there weren't any surprises at the qualifications. He really easily qualified for all of um, those events. Ultimately, he ended up as one of 18 black athletes on the team. Um, he was joined on the track and field team by David Albritton, John Brooks, Cornelius Johnson, James Laval, Ralph Metcalf, again, um, Fritz Pollard, Mac Robinson, Archie Williams, and John Woodruff. 
There are also two black women on the track and field team, uh, Tidy Pickett and Louise Stokes. There were five black boxers, James Clark, Willis Johnson, Howell King, Arthur Oliver, Jackie Wilson, and a black weightlifter named John Terry. There were just over 300 athletes at uh, competing on the American team at the Olympics. So, um, you know, 18, they were certainly, certainly not uh, the majority of this team, of this Olympic delegation. Um, we'll chat a little bit more about some of those other folks as we progress, but I do want to point out some of those names. David Albritton is pictured there on the left in the Ohio jersey. He was a teammate of Jesse's, uh, Jesse Owens's at Ohio State, uh, was also from rural Alabama. He's shaking hands there with Cornelius Johnson uh, after the two had tied and set a new world record for the high jump at the Olympic tryouts. Um, we talked about Ralph Metcalf and his congressional career. David Albritton also went on to hold elected office. He became part of the Ohio House of Representatives uh, in the 1960s and 70s. James Laval went on to a distinguished career as a chemist and scientist. Um, Mac Robinson uh, is probably not quite as famous as his younger brother, Jackie Robinson, who of course broke the color barrier in modern baseball. Um, again, we'll chat more about some of these some of these names as we move through the, the series, but Jesse certainly was not the only black athlete um, at the 1936 games and not the only one who uh, you know, was incredibly successful both there and later in life. Um, despite their success at the tryouts, though, the 1936 Olympics almost did not happen. Um, you may remember last year, um, the 2022 uh, Winter Olympics in Beijing, there was a diplomatic boycott. Maybe you remember the reciprocal boycott at the 1980 and 1984 games. Um, you know, these boycotts of the Olympics, it's not something that's new. Um, these, there was a really, really strong boycott movement for the 1936 games. Um, the Olympics took place against a really tumultuous backdrop. Um, of course, Hitler and his Nazi party had taken power in 1933 and had almost immediately began putting in place discriminatory policies against German Jews and other minorities, uh, most notably the 1935 Nuremberg Laws which stripped German Jews of citizenship and equal protection. Um, in 1935, fascist Italy, you know, sort of an ideological ally of Germany had invaded Ethiopia. In the spring of 1936, Hitler had remilitarized the Rhineland in violation of the Treaty of Versailles, which had ended World War I. Um, so there was, uh, you know, a really healthy contingent of Americans and, you know, people across the world who felt that the U.S. could not in good conscience participate in the 1936 Olympics in this, you know, fascist totalitarian state. Um, the supporters were concerned, supporters of this boycott were concerned about German anti-Semitism, discrimination, discrimination against Catholics and other minorities. Um, and in fact, you know, these boycott movement, this boycott movement was part of a larger, um, you know, sort of set of protests against um, Germany, German, Germany's policies which included boycotts on German goods. Um, and, you know, the boycott effort was pretty broad based. There was a lot of support um, from a lot of different corners of the country. Um, Jewish, Jewish athletes and groups supported the boycott. Um, Catholic groups supported the boycott. Labor groups supported this boycott. Um, Anti-fascist groups that were opposed to Hitler and fascism um, supported the boycott. And so did some of the members of the Black press and the Black um, community. Pretty much everyone who was a member of the Black press um, agreed that the boycott movement was kind of hypocritical um, because Black athletes were routinely excluded and discriminated against uh, in the U.S. You know, Jesse Owens, for instance, we talked about how he wasn't able to live on campus because of his race at Ohio State. Um, he was denied service at restaurants and uh, hotels. Major League Baseball at this point was was still segregated. So pretty much everyone um, in the Black press said, you know, shouldn't we focus on our issues at home? Isn't it a little hypocritical to say, you know, to, to not participate in sports in this country when basically the same things are going on right here in the United States? Um, that's not to say that there weren't members of the Black press who didn't support the boycott. Um, you know, for the for similar reasons that other supporters had. Um, others, though, saw it as a chance for Black athletes to demonstrate their prowess. Um, 
for Black people to sort of demonstrate their ability on the world stage. Um, this newspaper clipping I have here is uh, a note about a Harlem church that was urging a youth boycott, um, or rather an Olympic boycott. Um, by the way, this is probably, they were probably wanted the US athletes to boycott both the winter and the summer Olympics, both of which were held in Germany in 1936. The, the winter Olympics were held in the early winter months. Um, and the Summer Olympics, of course, were held over the summer. Um, so, you know, a lot of a lot of support for this boycott movement, and it was a pretty close thing. Um, the Amateur Athletic Union, a really important um, component of the American Olympic Committee, held a vote in December of 1935 um, on whether or not to boycott, the, you know, the German Olympics. Um, and there's only a three vote difference. Only a th it was only three votes difference um, in favor of participation. So if three more delegates had voted to approve this boycott, it's very possible that the American contingent would not have participated in the games and that therefore uh, many of the countries who were sort of following America's lead regarding the boycott also would have stayed home. Um, that didn't happen though, of course, the US did participate in these games and ultimately more countries than had ever before participated in, in Olympics uh, were present in Berlin in the summer of 1936. So the games. Um, go to the next one. Hitler saw these games as a really important opportunity for uh, the world to sort of see a kinder, gentler Germany. Um, he basically saw the whole thing as a big propaganda opportunity. He had inherited the games um, from you know the democratic regime um, that had existed before he took power. Um, you know, they'd been awarded to Germany before Hitler took power. And um, Hitler was, was, you know, again, really pleased to have sort of have these, you know, have inherited these games. Um, the international community had sort of been ostracizing Germany um, in the wake of you know, the remilitarization of the Rhineland, um, the Nuremberg Laws, um, you know, other anti-Semitic and discriminatory policies. So Hitler saw here a chance to present this kinder, gentler Germany that deserved to be part of the international community um, that should be, you know, not seen as a rogue state, but embraced as an important uh, member of the world. Um, and they really spared no expense in presenting this positive illusion of a peaceful and tolerant Germany. Um, signs, you know, anti-Semitic signs were, were sort of taken in. The German press was told to uh, relax its most strident anti-Semitic rhetoric. Um, the uh, German authorities were told not to enforce certain laws um, among foreign visitors. Um, the idea, again, being to sort of present this image of Germany as, you know, sort of a, a normalized um, state where Nazism and Hitler were both really popular and beloved by the um, beloved by Germany. Um, of course, you know, again, just want to emphasize that that, that really was an illusion. Um, visitors to Germany in 1936 were not seeing the censorship, the, you know, imprisonment of people in concentration camps, the rearming for war. Um, this was all really carefully orchestrated by the Nazis to present this positive view that, again, in reality, um, did not reflect what was actually going on in Germany. Um, this picture here is, is just a street in Berlin. You can see it's festooned with Olympic and Nazi flags and, you know, full of uh, spectators and visitors, um, you know, eager to see athletic competition. Um, when I said they spared no expense, part of uh, those expenditures included the construction of this massive 100,000 seat ceremony where uh, many of the events and medal ceremonies would be held. Uh, you can see from this picture just how packed those stands were, how popular these games were. Um, and of course, in the foreground of that picture is a large swastika, the symbol of uh, the Nazi regime. So let's talk a little bit about Owens's accomplishments at these games. He ran in the qualifying. So his first event, the first event that he qualified for was the 100 meter dash. Um, he ran in the qualifying heat on August 2nd, which was the first day of the games. Um, and when his name was announced before the heat, he was met with this enormous cheer from the crowd. Uh, which really surprised a lot of people, including Jesse Owens and including Adolf Hitler. Um, Larry Snyder, Jesse's coach from Ohio State, had traveled with the Olympic team, um, you know, to Berlin and had told Jesse to prepare for a hostile crowd. Um, you know, from Germany, of course, the, the Nazi regime um, was racist. 
um, in addition to being anti-Semitic, um, you know, did not think highly of black people. So, you know, Jesse was sort of expecting this, this very hostile crowd. Um, he was wrong. I mean, they, they, they really adored him um, even before he'd run a race. He was already sort of a celebrity, especially, um, you know, from those uh, feats in Ann Arbor in 1935. Um, so, you know, the, a lot of these German spectators are really eager to see him run. Jesse won the qualifying heat really easily. Um, he led up in the last 20 meters because he was so far ahead, but he still tied his own world record of 10.3 seconds in that qualifying heat. Um, in the quarterfinal that afternoon, um, he actually ran a little faster, 10.2 seconds, uh, but that record was disallowed because of a tailwind, um, which happens sometimes in, in running events. You know, if, if officials decide that the wind helped the athlete too much, they'll say that doesn't count as an official time. Uh, the semifinal was the next day on August 3rd. Um, he again won that race and qualified for the final. Uh, the final was also on the afternoon of August 3rd. The athletes, the six finalists, drew lots to decide which lane they would be in on the track. Uh, Jesse drew the inside lane, which was the muddiest and least desirable part of the track because the mud slows you down. Um, but nonetheless, he got a perfect start. Um, he beat Ralph Metcalf, who earned the silver medal by four feet. Uh, with a time of 10.3 seconds. This picture here is Leonard Strandberg, a Swedish runner congratulating Jesse Owens. Um, after that 100 meter race, uh, Strandberg came in sixth. Jesse, of course, won gold. So how did Hitler and the Nazis respond to uh, Owens's success? Well, the popular story emerged pretty quickly that Hitler had refused, had really pointedly refused to congratulate Owens. Uh, there's actually a bit more to this story. So on the first day of the games, which remember was August 2nd, Hitler had invited two German gold medalists, uh, Tilly Fleischer and Hans Volke, to his box for personal public congratulations. This is a picture of Hitler and some other Nazi leaders in, in Hitler's box at that stadium. So he'd invited these German gold medalists to his box where he personally and publicly congratulated them. Um, he did the same for some Finnish medalists. Um, the Finns fell under that same classification of Aryan that the Nazis had made up, um, you know, to sort of argue that they were racially superior to everyone else. Um, so Hitler, you know, was basically publicly congratulating these Aryan, quote unquote, Aryan winners. Um, so then it started to rain after he congratulated the Finns, it started to rain. And um, after that, after the rain had started to come down, Cornelius Johnson, one of the Black American athletes, beat teammate David Albritton, another Black American athlete, in the high jump. So they, they earned the, the gold and silver medals, respectively. Just before the gold medal presentation, just before the American national anthem was to be played, Hitler and his entourage left the stadium. Um, of course, lots of people noticed this. They noticed Hitler leaving the stadium before um, these Black athletes were, were to be awarded their medals. Um, and they questioned Hitler's motivations for leaving. They, they you know, asked Nazi spokes, spokesman if he left because he didn't want to um, acknowledge the success of black athletes. The Nazi spokesman said that Hitler had just a, a meeting to go to. He entered and left the stadium on this um, set schedule. Um, others said that, you know, it's probably because he didn't want to, you know, acknowledge a black athlete. Um, either way, after this incident, the chairman of the International Olympic Committee uh, told Hitler that he had to be impartial. He either had to congratulate publicly all of the winners or none of them. So Hitler chose the latter. He chose to publicly congratulate no more athletes, um, even Germans, um, after this first day of the Olympics. So therefore, by the time Owens won his first gold medal, which was on the second day of the games, remember, uh, Hitler was not publicly congratulating anyone. So Owens, you know, probably wasn't really specifically snubbed by Hitler. Um, but you know, certainly it seems like Cornelius Johnson and David Albritton, who won medals before Hitler had decided to stop publicly congratulating victors, um, we, you know, were, were specifically snubbed by Hitler. Um, how did the stump story gain traction? Well, the press in America started reporting that you know, Hitler was ignoring Americans, not specifically Owens, but just Americans generally. Um, and then it sort of adjusted that and said that it was snubbing Black Americans specifically, or rather Hitler was snubbing Black Americans specifically. Other papers sort of picked this up and changed it a little bit and started to say that Hitler had specifically snubbed Owens. Um, again, not exactly what happened. Um, and Hitler certainly wasn't happy that Black athletes, including Owens, were finding success at these games. 
Um, but Owens probably wasn't really like specifically snubbed by Hitler. Um, in fact, Owens denied the snub on the return home when he was asked about it by uh, reporters. He actually said that Hitler had waved and saluted to him um, as he walked past his box. Um, but Owens later in his life did start telling the story of the snub. He found that it was really popular um, with audiences when he was speaking to audiences. So it can be sort of hard to separate, um, you know, these these myths um, from, you know, what actually happened because, you know, so many people told the story so many different ways. Um, but again, just to wrap this up, if any American was specifically snubbed, it was it was really Cornelius Johnson and David Albritton um, who earned gold and silver medals on that day when Hitler was still publicly congratulating athletes. So Owen's next event was the long jump, which was called the broad jump then. Um, he actually struggled to qualify for the final in this event. Uh, the day after his victory in the 100 meters and shortly after he had to run qualifying heats for the 200 meters, he had to qualify for the afternoon long jump finals. He was favored to win gold in the event. Um, you know, he had the he had the world record in this event. Um, but things didn't go too well from the start. He, they got three tries. The athletes had three practice jump or qualifying jumps. So they had to meet a minimum distance in at least one of those three jumps to qualify for the finals. Um, as was customary with American athletes, Owens took sort of a practice jog through the sand pit um, before his jumps. Uh, but the German officials tagged this as a practice, as, rather as a qualifying jump. They apparently didn't know um, about this habit that American athletes had of taking this little practice jog. So they said, hey, that counts as one of your, uh, one of your tries. Owens was probably pretty thrown off by this. Um, on his second try, he actually stepped over the front edge of the takeoff board, and that attempt was thrown out um, because you know he defaulted. Um, so he only had one more chance to qualify for the finals. Um, he adjusted his uh, approach a little bit. He took off with half a foot of clearance, um, you know, from the edge of the board, so he didn't repeat that mistake he'd made in his second attempt, and really easily qualified. Um, there's another story um, that goes around about this event that probably isn't true. Um, it's sometimes said that a German jumper named Lutz Long came up to Owens between Owens's uh, second and third attempts and offered him some advice. Um, but that interaction wasn't mentioned by anyone at the time. And Owens privately admitted later that he hadn't gotten any advice from, uh, from Long between his second and third practice jumps. Um, but again, you know, it's a story that sort of has been repeated and, uh, you know, has become popular. Um, it probably isn't quite exactly what happened. Owen and Long um, did become friends, though, um, after the finals that afternoon, uh, where Owens earned his second gold medal and Long earned the silver. Um, Long was the first person to come up to Owens to congratulate him. Um, they spent a lot of time after that chatting back in the, uh, the athletes' quarters where the athletes lived during the Olympics. Um, and although Long was killed during the Second World War, Owens did stay in touch with the Long family um, later in his life. So the day after his victory in the 100 meter dash, the same day that he had uh, qualified and won the, the long jump, um, Owens had to run in two 200 meter preliminary heats. Uh, he ran 21.1 seconds in both races, which was a new world record for 200 meters around a turn as opposed to on a straight track. And then on August 5th, he won the semifinal um, and then set an Olympic record of 20.7 20 seconds uh, in the final, earning him his third gold medal. Mac Robinson, remember the older brother of Jackie Robinson, earned silver. Um, this was Owens' third gold medal of the Olympics, which is a feat that no one in track and field at the Olympics had accomplished uh, since 1900. It's been a long time since anyone had earned that many gold medals in track and field at an Olympic Games. Um, when he earned his third gold medal, again, the German crowd you know, was on their feet, roaring his name. Um, he was tremendously popular with, uh, with the crowds there. So that was three gold medals. And those are the three events that Owens um, had qualified for. Those were the three events that he planned to compete in, the 100-meter dash, the long jump, and the 200-meter dash. He was pretty much ready to relax, enjoy the rest of the games as a spectator. Um, at the Olympic trials, the athletes had been told that the top three finishers in the 100-meter dash uh, would represent the U.S. in that event in Berlin, and that the next four, the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh place finishers, 
would run in the four by 100 meter relay. So those, those four finishers at the Olympic trials uh, were Ford Draper, Marty Glickman, Sam Stoller, and again, Mac Robinson. Um, the team got shuffled pretty quickly. Mac Robinson, who qualified for the 200 meter, of course, uh, was replaced on the team by a white runner named Frank Wyckoff, who had run in relays at the previous two Olympics. Um, and it, there was you know, more shuffling to be done to that lineup. Early in the games, the American track and field coaches started to have some misgivings about the lineup. Um, they talked about the secret German team that they thought had been you know, preparing out of the public eye and might be good enough to beat um, an American team. Um, so it seemed like the track and field coaches were planning to drop Foy Draper, who was slower than Stoller and Glickman, and add Owens. Um, but the day of the preliminaries and the finals, the coaches decided to keep Draper and replace Stoller and Glickman with Owens and Ralph Metcalf. Now, Sam Stoller and Marty Glickman were both Jewish and, in fact, were the only two Jews um, on the American track and field team at these Olympics. So although we don't have good documentation about why exactly the track and field coaches made the decision to drop uh, Stoller and Glickman in favor of Owens and Metcalf, um, especially when they were earlier planning to drop Foy Draper instead, um, it seems very likely that anti-Semitism um, played a role in this decision. Some of the leading uh, track and field coaches and um, American athletics officials, including Dean Cromwell and Avery Brundage, were Nazi sympathizers, both Cromwell, who is a coach at USC, and Avery Brundage, who was the American Olympic Committee president, were members of a pro-Nazi organization in America. Um, and they may have wanted to save Hitler the embarrassment of having his team lose to Jews. Um, and certainly how Marty Glickman felt um, at the time, he, he felt very strongly that the decision had been made uh, because of anti-Semitism. Um, so how did Owens react to this? Well, again, this is a situation where we there are some competing stories. We don't know exactly what happened. Um, Ralph Metcalf and Frank Wyckoff both said that Owens had insisted to coaches, you know, leading up to this event, that he be allowed to try for a fourth gold medal and that he had not protested the removal of Stoller and Glickman. Um, on the other hand, Glickman said that Owens, when this decision was announced, stood up and said, coach, let Marty and Sam run. I've had enough. I've won, I've won three gold medals. Let them run. They deserve it. They ought to run. Um, Glickman said that Metcalf didn't protest, which you know, Metcalf later denied. Uh, when Owens wrote about this in his books, he more or less repeated Marty Glickman's story. Um, so again, sort of lots of ambiguity about how Owens and the other members of this track and field team responded to the shakeup. Um, however they responded, though, it's very likely that this decision was influenced by anti-Semitism um, to no small extent. The American team, of course, won this relay um, really easily. The Americans probably could have won with, with any four runners from their delegation, um, you know, even people who didn't usually run this distance. They were just that much faster than people from other countries. Um, and Owens earned his fourth gold medal. Um, Owens was not the only Black athlete who won medals at these games. Um, in fact, of America's 57 medals, 13 were earned by Black athletes. Um, and of their 24 golds, seven were earned by black athletes. The sharp-eyed among you might note that there are um, 14 listings on that little chart there. Uh, that's because Ralph Metcalf and Jesse Owens were both on that four by 100 meter relay team. Uh, team event medals only count once in the standings. Um, and that's also why if you see that there are eight gold medals listed, well, those four by 100 meter relay medals were both golds. Um, so all this, you know, that's 13 of 57 is, is nearly a quarter of the, um, the medal hall. Um, and all that, well, only 18 of America's 312 athletes were black, which is about 5%. Um, so certainly the America's black team, America's black athletes, um, you know, really, really outperformed expectations here. Um, great. So how did the Nazis respond to all of this black success? Um, well, again, publicly, the Nazis were really trying to present this image of, of their country, of their regime, as peaceful and um, tolerant. Um, but privately, a lot of the Nazis were really irked by Black success. 
um, because it undermined the myth of Aryan and white supremacy. Um, Hitler apparently was, was, was annoyed. Goebbels, the propaganda minister, said he called black success a disgrace and said, quote, that the white race ought to be ashamed, end quote. Um, however, black success here really didn't, you know, convince any of these, these believers in Aryan supremacy that they were misguided. Um, Nazi ideology proved pretty malleable. Um, instead of worrying that black success proved Aryan supremacy was false, which, you know, of course is true, um, that, you know, Aryan supremacy is false, the Nazis contended um, that black people were not even human. Um, an official in the German Foreign Office um, had, you know, this quote, compared black people to, to animals, um, you know, again, basically saying that, that Aryans were still the best humans, um, black people didn't even count. Um, by the way, this attitude was not uh, only held by Nazis. Dean Cromwell, remember him, the, the coach who was involved in the decision to drop the Jewish athletes, the Jewish athletes from the four by 100 meter relay team said pretty much the same thing, um, compared black athletes to animals. Um, so these, these are attitudes that were held both in Nazi Germany and in the United States. Um, so, you know, despite Owens's success, despite the success of the other black athletes, um, the Olympics were pretty much a, a massive success for Germany and its propaganda machine. Um, Germany's place in the international community was sort of normalized. Hitler was shown to be really popular at home. One New York Times reporter wrote that the games put Germany, quote, back in the fold of nations and made the Germans more human again. Um, Goebbels wrote that the Olympiad is a really big breakthrough. Uh, fantastic press here and abroad. The foreign press is quite wild with enthusiasm. Um, the Nazi regime was also really pleased because of the German athletic success. Um, Germany won more medals than any other country and the most gold medals. Um, of course, you know, again, this, this sort of vision of a peaceful and tolerant nation that it had been trying to present to um, the world was, was, was totally false. When the games ended and the foreign visitors went home, it was, it was back to business as usual for the Nazis. They ramped up the prosecution of Jews and other minorities. Um, they continued, of course, with militarism um, and imprisoning people in internment camps. Um, of course, ultimately, three years later, in 1939, uh, the Nazis invaded Poland, which kicked off World War II in Europe. Well, what about Owens? What happened to Jesse Owens after the games? Um, he had a pretty eventful life. He was met with a really celebratory welcome upon his return to the United States. Um, but throughout his life, he struggled personally and financially and continued to encounter racism and discrimination. Um, and that racism and discrimination re really didn't take a break. Um, you know, it's something that he experienced basically as soon as he got into back into the United States. His family were, were coming to New York to greet him um, as he you know, disembarked from the boat that was bringing him back from Europe. Um, they were actually denied service at a number of hotels because they were black before they found one where they could stay. Um, again, this is the family member of this you know, American hero, American celebrity who was getting ready to be paraded throughout the streets. His own family was denied service because of their race. Um, so, you know, he, he didn't continue to, to run as an amateur racer. He, you know, ran in promotional races and exhibitions and whatnot didn't really find um, a career or a vocation that he really, you know, felt comfortable in or felt very successful in until later in life when he, um, you know, found a lot of success as sort of a motivational speaker and a memoirist. Um, and his accomplishments, uh, you know, really turned him into a symbol at later in life. His accomplishments in the face of these, these great challenges really turned him into a symbol of uh, accomplishment and Black success later in life. This is a picture um, later in his life when he was awarded an honorary doctorate from Ohio State University. Um, next slide. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, what is his ultimate legacy? What is his, you know, what, what lessons can we take from his life? Well, you know, Owens' success might not have, um, you know, halted this, this belief in Aryan supremacy. They might not have ended racism back in the United States, uh, but they did demonstrate that accomplishment in the face of incredible challenges is possible. Um, you know, they did show that that people from the unlikeliest backgrounds, the son of a sharecropper, the grandson of enslaved people, uh, can accomplish incredible things. Um, it's, you know, his legacy deserves to be remembered and recognized, and the United States over the years certainly has done so. Um, posthumously, he was awarded the um, Congressional Gold Medal 
He was awarded during his life the uh, Medal of Freedom by Gerald Ford. Um, lots of tribute to his memory. Um, and this is just, you know, this presentation again is just a, a small way uh, to commemorate Jesse Owens' success and his accomplishments again in the face of, um, you know, incredible adversity and racism at home and abroad. That's about all I have. I would love to answer any questions, um, respond to any comments, elaborate on any thoughts that people might have. Um, while people formulate their questions, um, just want to plug our next Lunchbox lecture, which will be exactly one month from today on March 23rd at the same time, noon. So make sure you get that on your calendar. Go ahead and schedule that. Um, Again, reminders about some of our other upcoming events. Homeschool Day is next month, March 31st. Our Family Day is on um, April 22nd. So again, get those on your calendar. Great, looks like we have a question. Another African-American athlete who challenged Nazi, Nazi presumptions was Joe Lewis. Did Owens and Lewis interact? Yeah, great question. They were actually really good friends. Um, they were really close. Now, Lewis didn't compete at the 1936 Olympics. He was a professional boxer at that point and you know this was strictly an amateur affair um but owens and lewis were, were really good friends there's actually a dual biography of the two um i'm forgetting the title right now um but you know they were main friends throughout their lives um and you know both really did did stand up to the, you know these these nazi ideas of aryan supremacy yeah Cool. Any other questions or thoughts? If not, I guess we will end it here. Again, thanks so much for your time. Really enjoyed chatting with you. Hope you had fun and learned something about Jesse Owens.